Today is all about diffusivities. We're going to talk about uh, the molecular basis for these properties. And, uh, and you know, before really getting into the molecular details of how diffusion works, uh, let's just say a little bit about uh, the general sort of mathematical features of random walks. Uh, so diffusion basically is a random walk. Uh, it is a, um, it, you know, random walk, if you want, you can think of as this meandering trajectory, taking little steps in all directions uh, with no bias for any one direction. Uh, that looks something like this little trajectory shown here. So it starts right here at the origin in this in this uh, uh, coordinate system here showing two-dimensional random walk. And after some time, even though uh, the trajectory isn't uh, biased to go in any one direction, it does move away from where it began, right? So you may find it over here, you may find it over there, uh, but you will find it somewhere off away from, from uh, displaced from where the trajectory started. And uh, so this is after some time delta t. And the theory of diffusion predicts that this mean squared displacement uh, behaves like 2 times the diffusivity times time in one dimension, 4 times the diffusivity times time in two dimensions, and 6 times the diffusivity times time in three dimensions. Okay, so uh, let's kind of get an idea for why uh, the formula looks like this uh, by considering a random walk in a single uh, dimension. Okay, so imagine that at every single time step delta t, uh, this random walker takes a takes a step uh, plus or minus a small distance l along this x-axis. So x here is the vertical direction and time is the horizontal direction. And so we're going to take random steps up or down, and we're starting out at the origin. And uh, so you know each of our steps are of size plus or minus l, and the total distance that we've moved from the origin here. Uh, is the sum of all those steps, right? So, uh, so what is the position after n steps? Well, it's just the position after n minus one steps plus a random plus or minus l from the nth step. And so we can we can ask now uh, what are the the statistics that describe the variance or the the width of this distribution? And and so uh, that is given by the mean squared uh, size of this x n. Uh, which can be expanded, right? I can use this formula and square the, the right-hand side now, and I get x n minus 1 squared. I get a cross term uh, that involves x n minus 1 and the random step, and I get the random step squared. Now, uh, this term is obviously going to also be positive, and this term is clearly L squared, uh, but this term is a you know random displacement times another random displacement, and there's no correlation between the n minus one steps that happened before and the nth step. And so because of that, uh, these things being independent, this just uh, this this cross correlation term here just vanishes uh, from the average, and you end up with this identity that x n squared is equal to x n minus one squared plus l squared, which is really pretty important. It tells you that uh, that the squared displacement after um, after n steps is uh, the squared dis is growing by l squared with every single step. Okay, so uh, each step now contributing the same amount to the variance uh, tells you that that you must have that the mean squared displacement is proportional to the number of steps times the l squared because of the way uh, this formula grows. Okay, so uh, now how many steps? Uh, did we actually take? Well, that's uh, the number of steps is the total time elapsed divided by the time uh, interval per step. And uh, therefore, we can write down this formula that tells us that xn squared is equal to 2 times uh, this result, l squared over 2 delta t times t. And so we identify this quantity in parentheses as our diffusivity in one dimension, right? So if the steps are l squared, and the time interval between steps is delta t, then we would write down the diffusivity as l squared over 2 delta t. Okay, so uh, that's a, a pretty useful uh, estimate to remember that you can get an order of magnitude on what is the diffusivity by thinking about the, uh, the size of steps and the frequency with which they occur and uh, taking a ratio of those two things in this manner. Okay, so uh, the key results now are that uh, the mean squared displacement as a function of time is proportional to time and to the diffusivity with this factor of 2. And, uh, and that, of course, means that we've defined diffusivity as L squared over 2 delta t. Uh, OK, so, um, so that is a little introduction to the way diffusivities work. Of course, the size of those steps uh, and the frequency uh, with which uh, velocities are, are randomly changed uh, depends on the medium that you're in. 
And, uh, and so that brings us to thinking about diffusion in gas phase, diffusion in the liquid phase, and later we'll talk about diffusion in solids. Uh, for now, let's just think about the kinetic theory of gases, uh, where you have gas molecules described as, in the simplest case, uh, just hard spheres. And these are at low concentrations, so we can ignore the three-body collisions that would, would happen occasionally. And uh, instead, think only about these binary collisions, right? So you can think of a, of a bunch of billiard balls, dilute a dilute gas of billiard balls flying through space, and they're bouncing off of each other. And these are our molecules. And every time they collide, uh, their, um, their velocities are random, randomized by that collision. And uh, that results in the... Uh, random changes in direction uh, that occur at, at uh, in a direction of motion that occur at intervals uh, delta t, which is the time between collisions, if you want. Okay, so uh, people have thought very carefully about this and worked out a lot of beautiful statistical mechanical theories and shown that the flux of a uh, of a species A in uh, in these uh, gas molecules, this is sort of a self diffusion result actually, uh, is uh, minus one third of the uh, root mean square velocity multiplied by the mean free path between collisions, right? So this is something you may have learned in your PCHEM class that you can work out what is the typical distance traveled between collisions uh, between these billiard ball gas molecules and you can also work out from, from equilibrium statistical mechanics what is their root mean square velocity. And then you multiply this um, by the uh, the gradient of the concentration of a uh, particular species that you're considering, and that gives you the diffusivity, uh, or sorry, the flux, uh, the diffusion flux of, of that species. So from this expression now, and just looking back at Fick's law, we can identify that the diffusion constant for hard spheres uh, in the kinetic theory of gases must be uh, this expression, one-third of the root mean squared velocity multiplied by the mean free path. Okay, so that's the result that comes out of uh, pure component uh, vapor, okay? Uh, so, um, you know, a little detail on what these characters are. The root mean square velocity uh, from equal partition is, uh, equal partition is, uh, is easy to remember because you're just saying that, that the average kinetic energy, which is one half of m uh, average v squared, is equal to kbt. Uh, That's the thermal energy, right? So these things your science teachers told you in elementary school about temperature being related to kinetic energy were actually true. And, uh, and so this is the formula from equal partition that gives you this root mean squared velocity. Uh, so, you know, solving for VRMS, just, you know, take the square root of the right-hand side and you've got that. Uh, what about the mean free path? That's a little bit more difficult to derive, uh, but you can imagine how the calculation would go. You think about the cross-sectional area of the particle and uh, the, prob the, the rate at which it's traveling is this mean squared velocity and as it moves through space uh, there can be nothing in this little little cylinder that it traces out uh, or it's going to have a collision and so based on the density of these particles in space uh, which is given by the pressure and the temperature uh, you, can, you can estimate how frequently it will encounter another particle and have a collision, right? So basically the argument is that the volume, the average volume swept uh, along this cylinder between collisions must be equal to uh, the volume per sphere in the gas phase and that gives you an expression for the mean free path. Uh, you get pi over 4 times sigma squared. Sigma is the, the diameter of these particles so that's their cross-sectional area and uh, this is the uh, the um, uh, KT over over P. When you see KBT in this class, remember that that is just the gas constant, okay? So the only difference between them is this unit conversion of going from molecules to moles. Uh, so this is Boltzmann's constant, but it's really the same thing as, as the RT that you've learned to use as your gas constant. All right, so that's the kinetic theory of gases result. Um, when you uh, when you combine these two things, you can see in gory detail how the diffusivity from the kinetic theory of gases depends on temperature, on the size of the molecules, on the pressure, and on the molecular weights of those molecules, right? So, so you have predictions now that come from the kinetic theory of gases. They're not bad, actually. So the t to the three halves is pretty close to being correct. m to the one half into the minus one half is correct. p to the minus one is correct. And uh, sigma to the minus two is correct. Okay, so uh, kinetic theory of gases, this very simple framework uh, does a pretty good job. And uh, so this alone 
will maybe not allow us to do a good job predicting absolute diffusivities, but certainly is good enough uh, to predict how diffusivity will scale when I make a change in temperature, when I make a change in the mass, when I make a change in the pressure, etc. Uh, so, you know, it took a, a bit a bit more effort to work out the, the diffusivity in the case when you have two component gas mixtures. Uh, so there, um, you know, things are roughly similar, but now you have an effective size that is the arithmetic mean of the two sizes of the constituent of the mixture. So you've got A and B, their diameters, you add them, you take divide that by two. And, uh, and you also see that you get this harmonic mean uh, for their masses entered instead of uh, the mass of either one of them. Okay, so, um, so this is basically standing in for a uh, effective mass of the A and B collision pair. And, uh, and you also uh, see that the temperature and the pressure dependence are exactly the same. There's a little bit of a change in the prefactor here. Uh, so, so this is the result if you have a two-component gas mixture. Um, again, you know, the real value of this kinetic theory of gases is in predicting the scaling of the temperature dependence and the pressure dependence and size dependence and mass dependence. And all those things were really there in the single component uh, gas. But you, you could use this to predict diffusivities, but it's not extremely accurate. Uh, a more accurate theory is that of Chapman and Inskog, quite a celebrated result in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, thinking about, um, for the first time, how the degree to which molecules stick to each other and have uh, have you know partially inelastic collisions then uh, will will uh, affect the um, the diffusivity of those molecules. So you can imagine that you know as molecules collide, uh, if they stick for a moment, then during that time when they're when they're stuck, there are you know excitations that have happened in their internal degrees of freedom, and the collision pair is traveling more slowly. And then maybe they uh, transfer that energy back from their internal degrees of freedom into the separate degrees of freedom for the the uh, kinetic energy of those two particles, and they separate then. Uh, but this process, sticking during these collisions, actually affects the diffusivity. Uh, can affect the diffusivity quite a bit. Um, so you know, thinking about this molecularly. Uh, the, there is an interaction potential between uh, all molecules, even things like argon have a little bit of an interaction potential between them, between each other. And uh, so, so you, have, uh, you have potential energy here on the vertical axis and distance between the two, the two molecules involved in the collision on the, on the horizontal axis. And there's a uh, repulsive region where the molecules want to push each other away. They're too close. Their cores are overlapping, if you will. And at, at long distances, they attract each other. And, uh, you know, with a fairly weak attraction in the, in the vapor phase in most cases, at least at long distances. Uh, but there's an optimum uh, distance at which their energy of interaction is, the, is at a minimum. And that's this parameter epsilon AB that characterizes the degree to which the molecules stick together. Okay, so uh, how do we get epsilon AB? Well, uh, this depends on the identities of the A and the B molecules, but fortunately we have a rather simple way of estimating how strong two molecules of different types will attract each other. And that is by thinking about how strongly pairs of the same type interact with each other, right? So I can think about the interaction between a BB uh, collision pair and the interaction between an AA collision pair, and I can use the epsilon AA and the epsilon BB uh, to estimate the epsilon AB. And these are just these so-called Lawrence Berthelot uh, 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 mixing rules for describing the effective potentials between mixtures. Uh, so we won't go into that. Um, uh, maybe you can see Jacob's book if you want to see more about that. But, uh, but here is the, the formula for the uh, interaction. Uh, it is a geometric mean of the interactions between the pure gases. And we again have the sigma AB term here uh, with the arithmetic mean of the two diameters. This is again a harmonic mean that gives you the uh, molecular, the effective molecular masses of the collision pair. Uh, so every mean that you can imagine here is represented. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the formula that Chapman and Inskog derived is this, the diffusivity of AB uh, again has the t to the three halves dependence, again has the effective mass to the minus one half, again pressure to the minus one, and again uh, collision diameter to the power two, to the power minus two. There is this collision integral that characterizes the degree to which they stick. 
And that depends on this kt over epsilon parameter. So when you look up this kt over epsilon, you get the value of this collision parameter. And we'll continue more next time.